With that, I'd like to welcome CEO of the Press Herald, Lisa DeSisto, and CEO of Hussey Seating, Gary Merrill, to the stage. Welcome, you guys. Very comfortable, Gary. Very comfortable. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. So how does it feel to be the oldest guy in the room, right? Everyone yeah, no. was battling for Maine's <laughs> oldest company. Had the feeling for a while. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, can everyone hear us okay? Yeah, good. Okay. So um, let's start. Um, we'll talk about you and then we'll talk about Hussey and we'll open it up for questions and we'll have a good time. All right. All right. Uh, so let's start by where did you grow up? I grew up in Portland, Maine. What? Um, yes. Yeah, that's exciting. Went to Deering High School. After Deering, um, left and uh, went to University of Maine. Graduated with a degree in finance. Huh? Worked for a couple of years and then went back to school at uh, Babson for my MBA. And then went into public accounting, which uh, was an interesting uh, uh, experience, but it was great. It gave a lot of good background, a lot of good, a lot of responsibility early in my career. And I learned a tremendous amount in public accounting. And so, uh, which. Wh because so much has changed in public accounting, it right? Has. So it was like it the is. big eight, now it it's like the big, how Three many? Three or four, I'm, I lost okay. count, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah. I was with Coopers and Library, and it, which has now been merged with Price Waterhouse. It's Price Waterhouse Coopers. It's yeah. And so you got your MBA at Babson. Yes. And you were down in uh, Massachusetts and had to make a decision about where to go next, and uh, you came back to Maine. So yes. what were some of the factors there? I had some opportunities to stay in the Boston area, but uh, my wife and I were both from Portland. Our family's from Portland, and uh, we weighed the opportunities between Boston and Portland. There were fewer in Portland, I will say that, but yeah. uh, this is where we wanted to live. This is where we wanted to raise a family. Um, we love Portland. We love being close to the ocean. We love being close to the mountains and the, uh, and the lakes. So this was, uh, we felt right coming back, and uh, we never regretted coming back. We're still only two hours from Boston, so yeah. it still enjoys some of the... That's not including the traffic, of Correct. course, right? So... Um, and you have really interesting, I think you might be one of the few people in Maine that actually has a reverse commute, right? Yes. So you leave Portland and you go to yes, North, I, North... I live in Portland and, and go travel to, to North Berwick. Yeah. Right? How's I, that? How's that, It's right? not too bad. It's, yeah. it's actually 40 miles, 45 miles uh, door to um, driveway to driveway. It takes me about 45 minutes. I have several friends that uh, think I'm crazy to commute 45 miles, but they live in Boston, New York, and they go 15 miles and it takes them an hour and a half. So right, at least right. I'm moving all the time. Yeah. Anyway, so. I feel like no matter what you do, 45 miles, 45 minutes, right? right. It doesn't, doesn't matter. It's right. not, yeah. Now, before you worked at Cooper's, though, what was your first job that you ever had? Yeah, my first job I ever had was at working the counter at McDonald's. Uh, I was a 15, 16 year old, uh, way back, I don't want to count the number of years, but a long time ago. Which McDonald's was it? The one in Westbrook. Oh, okay. Has anyone been to that one? <laughs> you remember Ga Gary? That's right. He was trying to supersize you. No, this is. <laughs> no, this is before all. This is before you actually had to add the uh, receipts up in your head. You'd, people would come in and order hamburgers, Big Macs. You'd add them up in your head, and then you'd punch it in the register. Try that today with someone going in and asking them to not punch in everything and uh, right. count, the, count the change and everything else. Yeah, I, I think that um, counting changed is a lost art. I think people like without electronics don't know how to do it. So, so you do. I did. And that's a I skill. That's, you right. yeah, that's why that's I want to do accounting probably. I don't know. <laughs> awesome. So talk about your move then from Cooper's to Hussey. How did you get there? Um, I was at the point in my career at uh, Cooper's where I needed to make a decision whether I was, you know, you're working. Sherry knows, Sherry knows that it's an intense, intense uh, uh, experience and you had to make this decision whether I wanted to go for partnership level or I wanted to experience private business and and work and going to school at Babson I really got uh, interested in um, working for a company working in the strategic part of the company as well as the day-to-day the -day tactical um, experience and so I started looking through a recruiter and somebody called me and said there's a bleacher company in North Berwick that uh, is looking for a controller and I said didn't know too much about them though I did a little research and uh, one thing led to another and I went to work at Hussey Seating. And, um Tell us about your your uh, your first interview there. So who did you meet with? Because it's uh, uh, four generations of, of Hussies, right? That own the family. Uh, six the generations. Family. Oh, six. It was, Sorry. Well, wow. it was uh, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, when I went down, I, I met with uh, Phil Hussey, um, who was that, at that time was president and CEO, as well as Tim, um, who was my age, um, who was um, also in the business at the time. So I interviewed with Phil and Tim and, and a few other people within the company. And what was attractive for you to, to make that move? 
I like the the, the challenge um, was they they were a regional um, they were a main based company that as you grew with the company you weren't going to have to make a decision to move to Boston or to New York to to continue to grow within the company they were they were the corporate office was in North Berwick, Maine and uh, as long as you produced and as long as you were successful you were going to be able to stay and that was important to me be able to stay um, in Maine where they weren't again at the time a lot of companies that that weren't that weren't didn't have their corporate offices in, in Maine, so. Right, um, but then you did leave for a few years. I did, I left um, 2004 or so, and went to work for Emory Waterhouse here in Portland. Another fa long-term family company. Um, do you think they have Hussey Beat, or no? Uh, no. We're gonna have to, do, we're no. Gonna have to research that no, at the that, Press Herald, we're no. gonna take that on. Hardy, uh, yeah. <laughs> Charlie Hildreth bought that, Charlie's dad bought, bought uh, Emory out of a receivership in the, in the Depression. So oh, I think they only went two generations. So. Yeah, they got nothing on right. Hussey. <laughs> so um, then you came back. I did. I came back in uh, as the CFO in Time Flies, 2008-2009. We had uh, several good years, and uh, then unfortunately uh, um, Tim became ill in 2014-15. In uh, um, I worked alongside Tim, and uh, Tim on foot. Fortunately, passed away in June of 2016, and I became uh, president and CEO and the first non-family um, person to run the company. But as I tell people, I, I may be the first non-family. The family may no longer be um, family-run, but it is family-owned. Right. Hussey's own the, still own the company and still a tremendous support of the, the management team there at Hussey. And Tim worked with you to really plan your transition yeah. to CEO, which uh, was pretty amazing. Yeah, Tim was incredible. I mean, it, even. Uh, right up to the end, we were. I was meeting with him at his house, and we were talking about the business. Uh, Marsha, who's here, would uh, would say that Tim would light up when when Jack Rogers, who was the VP of uh, Sales, and myself would would come in to talk to him because he just was, he was so the, the business was so much part of him in his life, and uh, um, so we we're very proud that we've been able to continue on and, and continue the success that uh, the six generations of Hussies have uh, put us in a position to. To do. Yeah, so, and you're not alone in this um, sort of boomerang club at Hussey, which I think speaks, just speaks yeah. volumes to the culture of, of working there. That's what we do call it, it's a boomerang club at Hussey. I think it's up, to, we have about 300 people uh, working at the company, and there's 25 or so that have uh, worked at Hussey, left, and, and then come back. So it's a, it's a good culture and, a, and a, an, ex, an exciting place to work. Yeah, I think there's no better testament when someone thinks there's a better, you know, better deal somewhere, and they're like, "Oh, Gary's <laughs> back! Tell us about what it was like on the outside, Gary." Right. Um, but I think it's it's really positive for for the culture that that folks do yep. do return. So cool. And you had already uh, you were familiar with the board because uh, you already had exposure to them before you came became CEO. So right. No, I uh, knew many of the board members. Um, like you said before, then then back working closely with them, and I think that's one of the the uh, the successes of uh, of Hussey and why they've been able to survive the multi generational. I mean, obviously the statistics are that usually the the entrepreneur starts it, second generation takes over, and it usually fails by the third generation. Is and but I think the fact that Hussey's survived <laughs> six generations of, of of leadership is a testament to the way you know Phil Hussey, Tim's dad, and Tim put together the uh, the board of directors where we have is a we have, the board is made up of five independent four independent directors independent business people um, and three family members and so that lives it brings a level of professionalism to the organization and, and has helped sustain that uh, that uh, professionalism of the organization through all these years so, so um, we saw in the video that it started as a, a plow um, company and then I think you mentioned to me if you walk through the old port you'll see um, Hussey branded fire escapes, yes, right? Yes, still some of the old brick buildings you'll see. The, the Hussies, uh, after the plows, um, they had a little problem with the fire. I don't know if they had cross insurance at the time, but they burned down and <laughs> lost, well done. They, they lost, well done. <laughs> lost everything. Uh, and they looked, for a, uh, they looked for a product line for several years, uh, but it usually was based in structural steel. Um, and they did fire escapes. I mean, the first Winter Olympics at uh, Lake Placid, they did the ski jump. Oh. Um, they did water sports, and they did several. Um, then they went into outdoor bleachers, and and it just kind of evolved. And then in the 50s, they got into, um, as we call, telescopic bleachers. And so the the first bleacher installation was that nearby, Gary? Yeah. So I, what, you set me up for that question. Yes, uh, I think <laughs> Phil Hussey Senior um, 
was we were, they were doing outdoor bleaches, a small Model 100 type, uh, league fields, that type of thing, and the, the boys club approached Phil about putting a uh, bleacher indoors. And so Phil, again, looking, Phil Senior, looking for a product line, said, um, yes, you could do that, and then went back to North Brook and figured out what he wanted to do. And Love that it. was that was the first one, was here, right here in Cumberland Ave in, at Portland. So Phil would actually sell things before he actually knew if he could deliver on them. Has anyone else done that? That's a long tradition in Huston. Yeah, Huston. I love that. I love that. I love that. So um, I'm on the board at the Boys and Girls Club, um, and I can tell you it's not still the same bleacher set. Yeah. Um, but we can, we can give you a good deal. I you. bet you can. I, I, I'm taking. We're taking these seats right uh, after. Yeah. So. Um, uh, let's talk about num number of employees. So you, I think you said three, 300? 300 yeah. people. Yeah. Um, mostly based here in North Berwick. We do have some salespeople uh, remotely in Salt Lake City, uh, Minnesota, um, in Maryland. We also have an office in Ho Chi Minh City, um, which is in Vietnam. For We have about eight people. They do a combination of drafting as well as our sales staff, where we support our dealers in the Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific area. One of the things that you had said to me is not only is the, uh, the family multi generational, but also some of the employees are correct. Yes, we have uh, we have over thirty people that have over twenty five years of service at Hussey, um, and we also have uh, several families that have multi that are multi generation, second or third generation working at the company. Yeah, that's good and bad, but no, that's, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, let's talk about let's talk about the products because we're not supposed to refer to them as collapsible seating. Correct? No, they're that retractable. Is a, right, they're retractable. <laughs> very important. Very There's important. Some lawyers out here that know that that's not collapsible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's retractable. We take very good much pride in that. Yes. Yeah. So, so it's three main. Is it three different types of seating? Well, and, we, oh, what do we have up here today, okay. Gary? <laughs> so uh, we pro we. Service probably three different, three major markets. We um, about 60% of our, 65% of our sales goes through a, a dealer network um, throughout uh, the world. But in the United States, we have um, 35, 36 dealers that represent Hussey and sell Hussey. We sell at FO to be North Berwick to them. They're responsible for freight, the installation. Um, they may have other complementary manufacturing lines like maybe science equipment, uh, flooring, basketball backstop type uh, library furniture. But they'll go in and sell to working with the architect, sell locally to uh, our, our products, both the fixed seating, which would be in the auditorium, as well as the, the bleacher. Um, so this is about, um, like I said, 60, 65% of our business. Then there's a segment using the same products where we'll, we'll sell direct, where we'll have a direct sales team working with architects um, to get our product specified, and then working with the owner, um, usually, hopefully, the owner, but sometimes the general contractor, to get our products specified, bid, and, and we'll bid through that. Those are the the large stadiums um, that we were, you saw on the video, the arena um, and whatnot. And then we have the Clarence Share line, which is what we're sitting in. This is something that that we, uh, <laughs> this is an acquisition that we made in, uh, um, in, they actually have been in business relatively short amount of time, only in the 50s they started. And oh. uh, they uh, Newcomers. manufactured in Lake Bluff, uh, Illinois. We bought them in 2011 uh, and moved them back and uh, um, incorporated them into our manufacturing facility here at, at um, North Berwick. So what would people use these kinds of chairs for? These are um, usually in the front row of a, uh, where the basketball teams sit, oh, okay. or the first two or three, where they, you know, where you usually sit, they charge a thousand dollars a seat for the oh, games. Oh, yeah, 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 right, Celtics. right, yeah. So usually on, on the sidelines, um, also arenas um, and, uh, we'll, and, and convention centers, we'll use them in concert configurations, um, similar to this, where on the where if there's a concert being played, obviously the basketball backstops out, the hockey dashes are out, and then they'll, and they'll put floor seating down. So these are those. So it's a complementary product to our existing product mm -hmm. line. So uh, you guys are part of the, that magic where um, uh, arenas can transform from a basketball court to a, a hockey rink in, in no time. How, how does that work, Gary? Well, we happen to have a video that will show a Bridgestone <laughs> arena. That's, that's fantastic. Let's, let's take a look. <laughs> This is in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. This is the conversion video going from hockey, obviously, which is a different seating setup, which is before they had the concerts. This is 
is an end stage event where they put bracket some of the seats and put the stage at the end at the concert. Back to hockey. Pretty, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, I think that's where we, you know, we, we are a manufacturer, but I think what we're, uh, what we try to position ourselves as a solution provider. I mean, we, our engineering talent will go into it, to an arena like this and they ask, okay, what are you going to, what kind of events are you going to host? What's your conversion time? Because a lot of times the, the arenas are hosting 20 to 200 to 225 events a year. Like the uh, uh, Fleet Center in, uh, Fleet Center, I dated myself, the uh, <laughs> TD Bank, I'm sorry, well, there's no TD Bank people here, and the, uh, in, uh, in Boston where they'll convert from ho hockey to basketball. But they're all, like at Penn State, we just did uh, a facility there where they're very, their basketball is big, but they're also very big in volleyball and other sports. And so again, trying to convert the seating layout and conversion, the configuration to accommodate the best sight lines possible for the various sports. is something that we come in and our engineering and technical salespeople will work with the owner and say, okay, what are you playing here? What's your conversion time? What do you want to do? and uh, we help in, in, in developing that uh, ahead of time. So um, you, you had mentioned that um, bidding for the pro sports arenas, though, is not the most profitable, right? Uh, right? We'll, we'll, we'll pick our spots. Yeah. Um, but if we, can, we feel as though if we can um, get to the owner where we can position our quality, our service, and our, and our technical expertise, then we'll feel, feel as though we'll improve our opportunities to be successful on that bit. If we think it's just going to be low price, um, we won't work it as hard because, frankly, we're not going to be low price. So we have to select those jobs where we where, where the customer will value what we'll bring to the table. Um, so K through 12 college arenas are. It's our core business. K through yeah. 12 college and university um, work is is where we uh, do predominantly most of our most of our work. Um, do you think that everyone in this room has sat in one of your chairs at, at some point? Well, we like to think that if you've been anywhere in the United States and went to a high school or middle school and sat in a bleacher, there's a 50% chance you've sat in a Hussey product. Um, so we've been doing this for a lot of years and uh, um, basically from California to Maine to Florida. And um, is, the, is the space competitive? Like, who else makes seating? I don't think it's competitive. Our sales team does. But, uh, <laughs> I think they should just be able to sell us that pretty easy. But, I think uh, it sells itself. I this is too, so comfortable. Not, <laughs> not according to these guys. But no, the, um, our two major competitors, a company called Irwin Seating out of uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Very similar profile to Hussey, family company. I think they're fourth generation. Hmm. And there's a company called Intercal out of Kalamazoo um, that is owned by the Kotobuki Group, a Japanese holding company. But... Uh, and there's some other foreign, um, and, um, Comatic out of Australia and, and CETA out of uh, um, the Baltics, but it's it's mostly the three of us competing uh, day in and day out. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a tight circle, right? It is. Yeah. We, they, we, uh, the, uh, people say it must be nice to only have two other, three other major competitors. It is, but the other side of it, we know each other very well. Right. We know our weaknesses, and it's and it's still day in and day out, very very competitive. Yeah. Because it's public money. You know, a lot of times it's. Right. You, you can sell your quality and your service and your and your capabilities, but at the end of the day, you've got to be there price-wise uh, because it is generally it is it is public money. Yeah, that's right. Um, so let's talk about your management team. Um, so you step in as CEO. Who is around you? And did you build that team? Did you bring in new hires? Did you acquire the team? How, how's do you um, like everybody on the team, especially the folks that are yeah, here? Uh, how's that going? Them, yeah, most of yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So uh, Sean O'Leary um, is our Vice President of Sales. Sean is another Boomerang Club member. He, uh, he worked for us uh, and then left about 10, 12 years ago. And um, when Jack Rogers, who was our Vice President of Sales for 42, 44 years, was announced his retirement, he actually gave Tim a five-year notice. He told him uh, that uh, he was going to work till June 5th at 12 noon because it would be exactly 44 days and four hours and that he, he worked. <laughs> Um, so we brought Sean on about an hour, uh, an hour, an hour before Jack retired. No, a year before, <laughs> a year before Jack retired and, and transitioned um, into that. 
Um, that's a nice notice. Five years is ve that's is very indeed. professional. I don't think Tim believed him for the first three, but yeah. <laughs> but uh, and then uh, so um, after Tim passed, um, um, I decided in the fall to look for a CFO, and I worked with uh, Brian DeVoe from he's being known to some people. We work with Leaders LLC here, a small M&A firm, and we had worked with Brian on the Claring the Claren acquisition. Yeah. So I knew Brian, and uh, that's worked out very well. So he's our CFO, and. Jamie Rowe is another boomerang, is our Vice President of Engineering and Technology. Um, Jamie worked for us for a while, left and was General Manager at OneXNet. And uh, when I was networking with him for, um, for an IT, he said, uh, would you consider me? So I said, well, yeah. So yeah. kind of put the team together that way. Great. And um, you just recently hired a Director of Manufacturing, correct? Or are you close we're, we're, we're on that? Close, or what's very, going very on? close yeah, on yeah. that. Until yeah. I actually come through the door, I usually wait till right, right, <laughs> to make to any announce kind of it. Announce it, yeah. announcements. But you had a little trouble with that with that hire just in terms of a yeah, talent look, pool, right? Yeah, we were looking for the right person, the right fit. I mean, there's not a lot of manufacturing companies uh, left, in the, especially in the Northeast, um, and looking for that balance of, of experience and, and best practice experience. Um, and plant management, um, it's, it's a, it's a um, unique, and uh, we looked um, high and wide, and uh, I think we found a, a good candidate, but like I yeah. said, I yeah, you know, tell you, you know tell a person right. walks through the door, I'm right. not sure. So I wanted to ask you about Maine, though, from, uh, you know, plus or minus for recruiting and finding finding staff. How, how are you finding that? Do people flock here because they love the state, or, or they're like, ah, I'm not moving to Maine. Well, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's it's a challenge at times uh, recruiting. Um, at less so more recently. Um, earlier in my career, whether it was uh, at, at Hussey or at, at Emory, it was um, unless someone had a hook here, whether they vacationed here or they uh, had family here or the reason that they wanted to come back to raise a family, it was sometimes difficult to to attract. Sometimes the difficulty was, especially recruiting from the Midwest. Um, where housing and cost of living is a little bit different. That's thinking, okay, I'm coming to Portland, Maine. I'll be able to buy a house on the ocean and, and uh, have all these. And the cost of living is sometimes an eye opener for people. But mm. oh, that's uh, interesting. Um, but yeah. overall, I think uh, as technology increases and the ability to work remotely and uh, and it's, I think it's and people are looking at quality of life at, at certain parts of that stage of their life. I think it's it's actually an attract helps. Um, so that may helps attract people. Now you're a big employer, but you're not the biggest employer in North North Berwick. Yes. So it's competitive down there, right? It is. We're uh, you'd think in Little North Berwick, a town of four thousand, where we employ three hundred people, would be a big deal. But a quarter of a mile from our factory is Pratt Whitney hires two thousand people and has a million square foot of manufacturing space. So in the little community we're in, we're not even the biggest employer. So yeah, it's um, it's competitive. Uh, like I said. Uh, Pratt has 2,000. We also compete with a shipyard down at Portsmouth for welders and, and other craftspeople. Um, so it's a, it's a competitive environment. Yeah, yeah, which is which is surprising yeah. when you drive through North Berwick, <laughs> yeah. right? It's because it's adorable, but it takes 10 seconds. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, so uh, being part of a sixth generation company, the company's core values are, were established long, long ago. So yes. what are they and how do you make sure that they're instilled today? Um, I, the three simple ones, it, and it, it, but it resonates with the organization. It's a, a family company and we're in it for the long haul, long run. And I think that's important and it's very important to me to leading the company because we don't, we're not owned by private equity people. We're not a public company. I don't have to worry about uh, reporting to, to New York or Boston on a, on a monthly basis of what our financial results are. You're able to make decisions for the long term, saying, okay, we're in this um, and we're gonna sustain this and pass it on to the seventh generation. So we're able to make decisions that are best for the company, not for short-term short -term profits. We operate with honesty and integrity. I mean, that's a core value of the, of the Hussey family and, uh, and of their uh, forefathers, and it's something that I think bodes with the company very well. That doesn't mean we don't have disagreements, but I think we try to be open and, uh, and, and clear with each other. Um, and, I, and we care about the people we work with. I think um, that's very important to us, not only for our employees, but our, our suppliers, our customers. And I, and I think those three things have helped us uh, um, keep our North Star, if you will, in, in guiding this is how we want to operate the company. So. Um, one of the um, really cool things I think that you've done to reinforce your values but also give back to the community is the creation of the POWMIA chair. Can you tell folks you know, how that works? Um, 
that's on our website. You'll you'll see it. But it's um, basically um, the uh, the Rolling Thunder Group out of Massachusetts approached us several years ago that they would want a, wanted to have their goal was to have a chair in every um, arena and football stadium or public um, venue with a chair of honor for the follow for the POW MIA and it's they have their logo in the back. It's similar to these chairs that we we sit on and. Um, we will uh, we will manufacture and ship the chair to whoever as long as they uh, uh, will agree to have a dedication ceremony. So these chairs are in Gillette Stadium, they're at uh, arenas, football stadiums around the country, and they're not to be sat on. They're just basically um, a symbolic chair to, to, to honor those that um, did not return um, to, the, to, the, to the United States and, and, and ongoing memory to, to, to the dedication to the country. Yeah, what a nice visible reminder when it you're is. at a you know, a sporting event like that, just to, to take a second, because, you know, it's, yeah, it's right there. So that's yep. very, very, very good. So um, with the, um, the company's values and your staff of 300, um, how do you communicate with them on a regular basis? How do you let people know how you're doing and, and acknowledge the staff? What are your techniques for that? Well, one thing we're sort of known as Hussy Meeting Company. That's one of oh, our problems. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's hilarious. That's, that's, that's some, sometimes frustrating. But no, we meet with uh, we have we have a showroom um, where we have actually a telescopic a telescopic bleacher, retractable bleacher. Um, that uh, once a month we have the entire company um, in the showroom where we have a uh, half hour update meeting where we'll talk about um, safety, quality, um, business metrics, or wh where we are as a business, um, and maybe pick a particular topic uh, and uh, um, bring everybody up to speed, have a little, uh, oh yeah, we are also do uh, acknowledge years of service, anniversaries, uh, that type of, uh, um, and we also, uh, anybody that's gotten a special um, honor from the past month, we'll recognize them in front of the company. Um, but it's just a quick, fast-moving um, event every month. Yeah, I've been to the showroom. It's fun to see all your products, right? And then it must be fun to have all the employees and do they fight for different seats? Like, are some viewed as more comfortable than others? Is there any, you know, status if you get a padded seat? Everybody's a creature of habit. You end up going oh, in and sitting place. in the same place yeah, with the yeah. same people. No, yeah. it's a, it's what's challenging for for us at, at our company is um, a lot of the most employees just make component parts because they don't see they don't see this. They don't uh, get out to the Bridgestone to, arena. Arena, so they're. So when they see these pictures and they see these videos, it means a lot, and they take a lot of pride in that because it, when they're manufacturing, they're manufacturing a steel frame or, right. or, or then painting it and we put it on a truck and, and it ships away. So um, it's, it is fun to get out and actually see the product put together, operate, and it's, it's very impressive. And you also do some peer-to-peer uh, -peer recognition at those meetings, is that right? Do you have a Yes, we have, program? we have, we call it the Silver Plow Award, which, based, which is, um, any peer can recognize someone else in the organization for something that they've done above and beyond over the past month or when, uh, whatever time period they want. They write up a nomination, it's accepted, and then we present them with a, a little silver plow with a check for every year of business that we've, every, for a dollar for every year we've been in business. So, oh. yeah, so it's a $183 check this month. Wow. So, yeah. That's great. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. It, it, See, it, it does pay to be old, <laughs> yeah. right? For the staff, anyway. Um, so let's talk about mentorship. Throughout your career, who have been your mentors? Um, I've had several. I mean, it's it's there's no one person I think that you look at and say this person was my mentor because we're all different. I think we all look and say that person. I like that about that person's style that would fit with me because you can't be somebody else. Um, so everybody from well, there was a, um, a couple of professors that I had at uh, at Babson that I really looked up to and, and learned a lot from. Um, early on in my career in um, public accounting, there were a couple, uh, a partner uh, that uh, um, I worked closely with that I really respected. Um, and then when I've been with Hussey, uh, Phil Hussey um, is uh, Tim's dad, was someone I um, early on in my career enjoyed working with very much and, and learned a lot. And this, this, so there's people from from uh, different aspects of your life that I think you you, you see how they communicate, you see how they lead people, you see how they. Uh, um, Make decisions, and uh, and I think I try to you try to glean mm -hmm. something from from a lot of different people. So it's really composite of yeah, the folks over the years. Yeah. Yeah. So through um, uh, working with mentors or other people, what's the best advice you've ever received? 
What's the best advice I've ever received? That's a tough one. Um, but you knew I, I was going to ask you yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding. He didn't know that. That's a bonus question. I threw it in. I think just being yourself. I think you got to be honest and direct with people. Um, I think that's some of the toughest challenges as a manager sometimes is people don't like confrontation. And I don't mean in the face confrontation, but being honest and direct. Um, because if you're not, I mean, it just builds within you that to a point where it's not healthy. Um, and I think uh, trying to, to, and then listening. I mean, I think that's sometimes a, um, a skill that you need to acquire over time. Yes. <laughs> I'm not good at that, so that's why it really resonates. I need to take a minute. I'm not a good listener. No. <laughs> um, and then, um, what's the best advice you give? What's the best advice I give? I think, I think is is to to take a risk and try something. I think um, working with uh, technical people um, most of my life, in terms of whether you're in finance or whether you're in engineering people or IT people, um, they tend to be uh, people that have become successful because they're individual contributors. They're very good at their craft. They're very good at their profession, and they've risen with an, an, an accumulated additional responsibility. But at times when they transition to managers, they don't necessarily have that great at delegation skills because they mm -hmm. want to do it themselves. Yeah. So being able to say, you know, I don't need to get out, be 100% sure that before I make a decision, I can be, I have 80% of the facts, let's go, let's do this. Um, because, uh, and if you make a mistake, you know, that's good. I mean, if you're not making a mistake, you know, or have not made mistakes, then you're not trying, you know, pushing the envelope. So trying to get people to, Take responsible risk. Don't risk the company, but but right. uh, but, uh, but I think uh, pushing people to, to make decisions and move forward is is uh, what I try to um, lead and uh, push in, in, in terms of people's individual development. Now uh, I know Hussey takes great pride in um, really um, taking care of your wor workforce, and it is competitive. Um, and North Berwick, yes. as we just heard. So what are the things, the kind of benefits that you've had to put together to take care of your employees, but also make sure that you, you, know, you, you, can, retain, you can retain the best ones? Like everybody, we're struggling uh, with uh, trying to keep and attract people. And we know the benefit package is important. So we think we have a very competitive uh, health care package, um, including uh, health care as well as dental. Um, but we also have um, a profit sharing plan where 15% of all pre-tax income goes into a profit sharing which is shared with the employees um, that's important we offer tuition reimbursement at 100 percent for uh, anybody that um, goes back to school um, to try to encourage them to continue their education um, we uh, we encourage people to get involved in the community we will if they are involved in a charity we will then as a company we will support that individual charity also um, so we try to do is whatever um, we feel as though the employees value, we'll try to see if there's a way that we can, we can support that. From a wellness perspective, um, uh, you know, obviously um, having that uh, wellness programs throughout your company helps you with your long-term health insurance costs, but you do something novel where you actually offer on-site medical care. Yes, we do have a, a physician that comes um, in once a, once a week as well as an uh, on-site nurse uh, that's there four days a week, um, so that we offer that. We also have a, a small gym um, where employees can come and, and work out um, before or after or at lunchtime. So it's it's something that uh, we're trying to, again, offer. And plus, it's especially this time of year, it's a beautiful uh, uh, campus to walk around and everybody <laughs> gets out at noontime or sometime during the day to try to. Yeah, I think it's great, though, this idea of having a nurse and a doctor come to visit just from a productivity perspective right when people have to leave for appointments but to yep. have that on site is really pretty cool pretty cool yeah we're going to get that at the press herald now that i learned about that we are get, getting we are getting uh, a nurse for sure all right so um your favorite installation worldwide favorite installation worldwide there's a lot of them i think uh, one of the ones that, that gives you a, a tremendous amount of pride is is hong kong convention center which is uh, everybody's seen the iconic mm -hmm picture of Hong Kong Harbor that the Convention Center goes out. We have a 10,000 seat installation there, one of the 32 tier, 10,000 seat, which is a, is a massive uh, install. And to see that um, in operation is, is, is very impressive. But also, 
being a, uh, a New England sports fan, the fact that we have uh, the Gillette Stadium is uh, an impressive installation. Right, but, right. Uh, is Tom Brady? Oh, Tom Brady did sign that. He did that not shape. sign that, oh. no. Did you just put everyone's name on it? No. The <laughs> no. Isn't that Tom Brady right there, number 12? No, that's... Oh, wait, maybe right. you're right there. Right oh. <laughs> maybe the marketing people put that in later. I yeah. didn't see that. I don't know. Yeah, all I don't the remember that. I don't remember that being there. Well, makes it just made it more valuable. Wow. Um, so, um, how much tra how much travel do you have to do? Not too much. Maybe one week a month. Um, oh. It's it comes and comes and goes, but uh, it's not it's not too too bad. Yeah. And then, um, so what's your favorite thing about your job? My favorite thing, I think, is um, the people. I really enjoy working with the, the people that we have here at Hussey. And I think in the industry is, is kind of neat. Again, being a kind of a sports nut, um, it's being involved in that industry is, is fun. So I think uh, it's the people, it's the challenge. And I think, again, for a, for a relatively small company in southern Maine, we have big company challenges. I mean, we ship internationally. Uh, we ship 99% uh, of our revenue is derived outside the state of Maine. Which we love and yes. we thank you it's for right. that. So important for our economy. Yep. When you think about it, if you're a manufacturer and, you're, and your customers are out in the, around the country, the last place in the world you'd want to locate a factory is in Maine because basically there's no, to the east is ocean, to the north is trees. Neither one of them buy a lot of seats. Yeah. So we're, <laughs> everything is shipped, uh, shipped outside. Uh, but, but the other side of that, we're able to attract excellent workers and, and, uh, and offer a high quality of life to our, to our employees. So then what's the thing that you like the least about your job? Like the least? Um, probably, uh, probably trying to keep up with the emails. Oh. Uh, is early on in my career, of, um, it, it, when technology came and smartphones, it was supposed to make your yeah. life easier. I what thought we were going to get a day off. I know. You know that, what I mean? It's like, turned into a 24-7 job. Yeah, with yeah, a, yeah, yeah. So I think... Uh, that's the probably frustrating is is uh, uh, trying to keep that inbox down. Yeah. So I am going to send you a handwritten note as a thank you. Okay. Thank after you very this, much. not an email. <laughs> I am not going to send you an email because I don't want to burden you on that. And then what keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night? I think not much. I'll be honest. I think uh, at You're this a good point, sleeper? at this point in my career, I think I'm pretty. Uh, the company's doing well. Um, I mean, there's things that you can't control. Um, that uh, that will impact the business and impact the overall um, profitability of the business. Trump waking up and putting out a tweet on tariffs on steel, I mean, that's not good for us. No, uh, no. But I think uh, things that you can't, can't control, um, but that's business. You're gonna, when, when you're presented with them, then you, then you uh, figure it out and deal with it. But uh, um, there are different challenges as it comes along. So describe your main. Where do we find you when you're not um, driving between Portland and North Burr? Um, my wife and I have a small, uh, we have a place on the, on the beach down in Saco, so we oh. very much enjoy, uh, enjoy the ocean. Um, I love uh, also the lake. My brother lives up on Sebago Lake, so uh, we're able to enjoy both the beach and, and the ocean. Um, and uh, we really bought the beach house to attract, to convince our kids to come back and visit us. They both live outside the state. Oh, so, uh, yeah, so. yeah. So Will they, they be back? Are visit. we going to get them back? Yeah, well, well, I don't know. Maybe eventually. Okay. Oh, yeah, we 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 got to do that. We got that's our that's going to be our goal. Okay. We have a new, we have a new goal. <laughs> All right, and finally, before we open it up to questions, get the questions ready. Let's talk about Fenway Park. So those seats, are like I can barely fit in them. So they've got to be smaller than than these. These seats are lovely. I mean, I could sit through even extra innings in this seat. So, what do you do? You embrace it. You replace it. What do you do? Those aren't our seats. Right. Those are <laughs> Um, no, Fenway, I'm a big Red Sox fan. Fenway's very nice, but if it was up to me, I'd bulldoze it and start over again. And you could keep the wall and, and whatnot, but it, no, it's, the problem with Fenway is that it was built 100 and something years ago. They don't meet current fire codes, basically, because of uh, the row spacing and the, and the aisle, width of the aisle. So if you wanted to, to reseat Fenway um, to proper, to uh, current codes and, and uh, layout, you drop the seating capacity from thirty thousand to twenty thousand. I mean, mm. it just, it, it's just it's it's uh, unless you start it over. There's not a lot you can do with the with the uh, bowl. They've done as much as they can with the, uh, uh, the seating on top of the wall and and the uh, and the out in right field and behind home plate a little bit. But for the most part, there's not much you can do with the uh, Fenway other than uh, starting over. I think. Yeah. So you just got to do. You just got to do. Some of the other, you know, like. 
Coors Field, we've done that. It's a beautiful facility. Um, Cleveland Indians have a nice facility. Camden Yards in, in, uh, in Baltimore. There did you do that one? Camden Yards? No, we did not. Oh. I shouldn't have brought that one. No, up. you shouldn't have. <laughs> you should not have. Yeah, good. So who has questions for Gary? Let's get going here. Good, let's go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, right down front. Gary, there's there's a lot of focus in Maine on retaining and attracting people who are going to go into healthcare or into tech industries, very somewhat specialized areas, and not necessarily manufacturing. What about the challenges between retaining and attracting a manufacturing workforce compared to a lot of where the focus is otherwise? That's a huge challenge, um, and I think uh, it's uh, one of the things that I've spoken to people about is I think. Uh, for too long, we've tried to define success for, for our kids coming out of school as going to college. There's not enough kids going into the trades. Um, and I think um, my push is I, I can guarantee you that uh, there's people graduating with a four-year degree uh, making less than a master electrician that went into the trades. And, and I think that's a challenge for companies like ourselves, Pratt Whitney. Um, they're looking for, for 200 machinists uh, to be able to to, to fill the, the openings that they see coming um, from both increased work as well as retirement. We work very closely with York County Community College um, and as well as the area high schools, Sanford and Biddeford, um, to get kids um, in the, that college isn't for everybody. And, and, but people want to work with their hands, they want to work in the, in the trades. That's something that we, I think we got to uh, continue to, to, uh, to encourage and not just define success. You know, it's put into post-secondary education but it doesn't necessarily have to be defined, I don't think, as a four-year college. I think there's, there's tremendous opportunities for people to make a lot of money um, and, and do very well and be successful uh, in the trades. Plus, you could go in. You could go into Hussey with a, an associate's degree, work there for, for a yeah. few years, and then get full tuition reimbursement. Yes, right. We've so we have had people do. I would exactly do that. That, that is very right. cost effective. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to talk to my 11-year-old when I get home about this program that we just came up with. Right down front. Are you getting a chance to voice into the uh, potential moves and changes in the educational community? I had an opportunity to speak with a young man who was laying bricks on a walkway. He was obviously a college educator. And I asked him about that. He loves where he's going. And I have talked to a fair number of people who feel there's a disconnect, particularly, I'd say, I hate to put it this way, but a lot of young men have a lot of physical energy. And sitting in a chair confined, whether for the computer or a picture, is very uncomfortable for them. And I have this feeling that there are, there's a, a world of young people who would love to do different kind of work where they're moving, and yet they are being funneled and a lot of pressure from parents just to disappear into the computer. So I was hoping that you, uh, like one of the speakers who had here before, has made it a secondary mission of his work to get into the educational community. This was the man who was uh, from Jackson. Oh, from Jackson Labs, yep. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and he now seems to be very, he's cultivating the educational community. And I'm hoping that as you uh, evolve, you will have access to be a powerful voice, a little bit of change in the education community, what we value, our culture right. has to value what those machines. No, I, I couldn't agree with one. It's, it's important for, I feel, it's post-secondary education, uh, whether it's in the trades or whether it's at college and universities or whether it's in, in, our, in our tremendous uh, community college network that we have in Maine. But I think there's, there's opportunities for people to, to learn different, different trades. And again, working Sanford High School, which is going to be opening, I think, next fall, has got a, a wonderful uh, program for vocational. And, uh, and Biddeford, Soc Biddeford also has a, has a great program, too. So. Yeah, it, it is. It is very important, I, and, I, and I think people have the wrong perception of what manufacturing is. They go back and, and, and think it's uh, you know dirty and, and dusty and, and not what it, today manufacturing is. A lot of technology involved. Um, some of the skills that necessary to to run and, and program a robotic welding center cell is 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 someone that's both hands on, but has the technical skills um, that they've learned. Um, growing up in, in today's the day and age. So I think it's it's important to, that we as, as manufacturing people continue to promote. There are opportunities that are challenging and, and um, where you can make 
um, good money and get good, good benefits and continue to develop. I think you have to go back to Deering High School though and talk talk there. I mean, as a Deering grad, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, so. Um, and, but I also think the point that you made too about about parents about parents need to sort of work with their kids to change that definition of success. It's right. not just graduating from high school and then going to college. So. Um, Could be, but there's other yeah, right, there's right. all, there are opportunities out there too. That's right. Right. Uh, Gary, you mentioned the sixth generation company. I'm curious if the seventh generation is on its way into the company and how has, uh, how do you and your leadership deal with that? I'm not sure how we do <laughs> They're currently there are 17 people in the in the seventh generation, 17 I think, uh, and um, right now they're not at that age of going into the company yet. Um, some of them may come in for summer interns, but the family's done a nice job setting up um, rules and and processes and procedures around that in terms of um, they can come in um, come into the company, but specifically what they want to do. What, what what levels of expertise can there be? Is there a need? So it, it's something that uh, we actually have an outside consultant working with us to, to help um, structure that. But it is it is a challenge for, for the family and, and, and the company. But so far it's worked very, very well. Okay. Oh, up on the... Um, so hi, Gary. Um, I'm Jennifer Hall. I'm the Manufacturing Company in Bitterford, so I'm um, One of the challenges that we've seen is Kind of the the us against them mentality that has kind of evolved from a plant or production workforce and office workforce, and really like what our challenge is, is really trying to bridge that gap and kind of unify the company and make sure we're working with the same goal. Have you run into that at all, or kind of have any words of advice for a company that's kind of working through that? Yeah, that's uh, I don't know if it's a us against them, but I can, I hear what you're saying. I mean, in and by not having the man, the office people as co-located as they could be with some of the uh, the manufacturing people is a challenge at times. Um, we have tried uh, recently. We have uh, we've had the the Hussey Olympics, where we we have uh, an afternoon where we set up some games and we interdisperse both uh, manufacturing people and office people together on the same team and compete towards uh, um, silly prizes, but uh, more just to get out there and and we have company. Uh, two or three times a year, we'll have company uh, luncheons, picnics, um, and then we have the uh, the monthly uh, uh, monthly employee meeting where we try to highlight um, different functions because people in manufacturing may not necessarily know what somebody in accounting and purchasing does or, or whatnot, and trying to trying to take a little bit of snippets and, and help educate uh, each other in terms of what everybody's role is to make it a su success. It's it's uh, you know not. Um, not just the sales team or not just the engineering people, it's all of us together. But I think having that consistent communication yeah. um, for everyone in the company helps to, to bridge that gap. We certainly have the same issue with the Press Herald because we are a manufacturing facility yeah. um, as well. And then, you know, we have the reporters and the sales staff. So we that's a, that's a challenge for us is to, con is to connect people. Yeah. And I've been surprised at people that have worked at the company for so long that have never met. Yeah. Right. So we have to create those. You have to force those opportunities for them to, to come yeah. together. It's a challenge, though. I, yeah. Yeah. Question down front. Yeah. The next hundred years here, not an easy business. What's the outcome? I think it's it looks very good. I think uh, I think our our, as our um, country continues to uh, uh, look at opportunities for public space development of public space, opportunities for us to get together. I think that fits well with the products that, that we offer. I think uh, we are a sports crazy nation, so that helps us a little bit too in terms of uh, being able to provide product. But I think, uh, you know, even internationally, I think there's opportunities for us to grow internationally as, as uh, the rest of the world um, starts to mimic some of what we do here in the States in terms of venues and, and uh, public, public seating space. Uh, you talked about when um, colleges are recruiting students that you know one of the parts of the tour is to take them into the athletic facilities. So it, you, whether yeah. they're an athlete or not, it becomes part of your decision making process. So yeah, we, what we've seen is, and um, many of you probably have experienced this, where uh, um, there's just an arms race between D1 and Division one schools and D D two schools in terms of their athletic facilities, they use it as a recruiting tool, not just necessarily for the athletes, but as students to come here. Look, we come to if you come to Penn State, 
I mean, they have a hockey rink, they have a basketball rink, they have a football stadium, and it's not all the kids coming are gonna gonna uh, gonna play the sport, but they want to participate and be part of that that whole uh, um, uh, school pride and, and the sports scene. And so, as a result, good for us. Uh, maybe bad for you people paying tuition, but uh, but it's been uh, but it's really started out a uh, helped us a lot in, in, in a lot of facilities around the country where we're providing um, some incredible seating. I mean, it's 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 amazing. It, what some places around this country uh, uh, build for facilities. Uh, I mean, in, in Indiana, which is basketball crazy, um, they'll build, a town of 4,000 will build a gymnasium that seats 4,000 people because they got 2,000 for their uh, uh, town and 2,000 for the team that they're competing against. I mean, the venues are incredible. That's good business. That yeah, is good that's business. That's good business. Like that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, up. Colleen? Where's the most unexpected place where you find a Hussey seat? The most unexpected place you find a Hussey seat. Um, we get a lot of them. Uh, we've been in South Africa. We have some installations in Africa. Uh, we got some in, in the Middle East. Um, so it's... How can we tell? Like when you go to it, you know, do we go like this and try to lift the seat up and look for the Hussey brand? There is a Hussey brand. A lot of times they, we don't have our, on the plastic chair, we will have a, a small oval, the Hussey oval, but branding is such a big deal. A lot of, a lot of these, are, they don't want our logo splashed all over there. The seat, they want to save that for paid advertising. Which um, I appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again to our sponsors. Uh, maybe to come back to that question, the most unusual is, is our, um, Jamie Roa, Vice President of Engineering and um, Technology, is a big outdoor person, big fisherman. And he was up in Labrador somewhere. He drove 12, 15 hours and flew into this this uh, uh, fishing camp. And so he sits down, they go in to, to sit down, and there in the middle of the floor, uh, one of the seats was a Clarence seat, one of these seats, a Clarence seat that was made in like, 1962 or something like that because there's a date stamp. So. Jamie took a picture of it and sent it back saying, yeah, here in the middle of nowhere, uh, you found a Clarence C. So I think we should do a little promotion where we send people out to the old port to take pictures of the okay. Hussey fire escapes, right. and then on social media, they should post them, and then we'll give them a prize. All right. That sounds I don't good know what me. the prize will be, but let's make that happen, everyone. <laughs> uh, so, um, oh, Phil, question? Gary, you mentioned the core values of honesty and integrity, and I'm curious if the lack of honesty and Integrity in the White House is hurting your international opportunity tonight. Oh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, I've traveled internationally some, and it's it's it, it it's interesting um, uh, on the reaction. But it, right now, people are I think uh, just sorting, trying to sort it out like we are. And I think it's we haven't found any problems. I um, mean, pe people. A lot of international work is based on relationships, not so much with the government, but with you. Um, and if they feel as though you're, they can trust you and you've, they've been successful working with you in the past, um, I think that to date I haven't seen any in indications that that's, that's impacted us in, in, our, in our work. Maybe what's wrong with uh, not having enough attendance or religious uh, that's right. <laughs> oh, you know, that's an interesting question. Do you do um, houses of worship? Actually, uh, we, we, don't, we don't do much in worship, but our uh, single biggest annual customer is the, uh, the Mormon Church, the Church of Latter-day Saints. Oh. They buy, not exactly as thick as this, but the, the seats similar to this, uh, they buy sixty to 80,000 seats a year from us. Uh, and uh, where they they put in their missions from around the world. But, uh, See, now that's the answer to Colleen's question, right? Yeah. Wow, that's great. All right, uh, I think, is this our last question, Amy? This is our last one, so make it a good one, Linda. My question is, is there a lifetime of these seating uh, stadiums? And I would think that's the source of traditional businesses to go back in and replace what they Yeah. Yes, it's actually a big part of our business is, is both the repair and renovation work as well as replacement. 
Unfortunately, it, it's a little bit longer than I would like. It's usually 20 to 25 years before we can go back in. And, oh, and quality it. merchandise, right? It's got its drawbacks. So, but yes, I mean, uh, um, just like Nashville Arena, that was actually a receipt. Um, they, they wanted an upgrade after 20 years um, to go in and re we replace the seating. Same thing in the uh, education market, K through 12 market. Um, a lot of times they can't rebuild the school, but they will want to bring their, their uh, product up to current code and requirements. And uh, so we have a uh, significant amount of our business is, is renovation and, and repair, which uh, uh, is something that we, we focus on quite a bit. Well, we thank you all um, for coming. Thank you to Gary and for his team at Hussey Seating for outfitting our stage. Uh, this morning. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm super excited that it's Friday and the weather looks fantastic um, this weekend. And um, we're taking the summer off for like, like a boss. We'll be back in September with Glenn Cummings from USM for our back to school edition. And Deanna Sherman from Dead River is going to join us uh, just as things start to get cold again. So no rush, no rush to get, uh, to get there. So thank you all again for coming.